The entire system of how soccer players move between teams around the world may be transformed after a judge ruled against FIFA. We also have updates across the football world, and later we're speaking with the CEO of Ironman on growing and broadcasting one of the most intense participation sports out there. It's Monday, October 7th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're speaking with Ben Jacobs of Give Me Sport on how and why FIFA may have to rapidly rewrite its transfer market rules and what that will mean for soccer generally. We had another wild weekend of football on and off the field. F1 and the Savannah Bananas are selling loads of tickets for naturally very different reasons. And later we'll chat with Scott DeRue, CEO of Ironman on the growing world of endurance sports. First, here are your top headlines. We begin with a positive. The NFL reports that its preseason concussion numbers were at a record low this year with 44 between practices and preseason games. That marks a 24% decrease from last year and is the lowest number since 2015 when the league began tracking this. Jeff Miller, who oversees player health for the league, said that, quote, the reason for that change has certainly to do with changes to rules, changes to equipment, including the Guardian cap, as well as a host of other efforts we've made over the years to drive the numbers down. Well, this is a great sign. 44 in preseason alone is still a lot, and this is still a real problem for the NFL. We also have a long way to go when it comes to repeat concussion sufferers like Tua Tagovailoa, whose playing future still seems up in the air. Saturday was a historic day in college football history, with four of the AP's top 11 teams upset by unranked opponents. The day was headlined by Vanderbilt taking down number one Alabama, hanging on for a five-point win, 40-35. Vandy students stormed the field and ripped out a goalpost, parading it through the streets of Nashville before dumping it into the Cumberland River. However, an interesting wrinkle to this one, according to SEC rules, when fans storm the field at a home game, the school is fined $100,000 and the money is given to the visiting team. So Vandy's win was an expensive one. And while none of the other upsets saw the same postgame spectacle, number four Tennessee, number 10 Michigan, and number 11 USC were all upset by unranked teams as well. On a personal note, ESPN's College Game Day came to my city of Berkeley for the Cal-Miami game, and I could hear the crowd from inside my house a mile and a half away at four in the morning for a game that started at night. Not even mad, that's amazing. Meanwhile, NAL continues to be a major sticking point for former players who couldn't benefit from it. Terrell Pryor, who played quarterback for Ohio State from 2008 to 2010, is suing his former school, the NCAA, and the Big Ten for an undisclosed amount over the profits they made using his name, image, and likeness as, quote, arguably the most recognizable name in college football. The suit says the NCAA hosts videos on its own website as well as on YouTube that include Pryor, and the institution still make money from selling his merchandise. Pryor is the latest former NCAA athlete to litigate over NIL discrepancies following Reggie Bush, a group of Michigan players, and the NC State Cardiac Pack from the 90s. Speaking of former players, NBA champion Dwight Howard was vindicated this weekend after Calvin Darden Jr., a businessman who scammed Howard out of $7 million, was convicted by a New York City court. Darden had convinced Howard to send the money by telling him it was for an investment in the WNBA's Atlanta Dream. When the prosecutor asked Howard what he had gotten in return for the investment, he said, a slap in the face. Darden was also convicted of scamming former NBA player Chandler Parsons out of $1 million for a supposed investment into the development of James Wiseman, who currently plays for the Detroit Pistons. The prosecutors say Darden should face 11 to 14 years when sentenced next year. We stay in court as we flip over to FIFA, whose multi-billion dollar transfer market faces uncertainty after a European court ruling challenged rules around contract terminations. Short version of the ruling is that FIFA's requirement for clubs to be compensated when players terminate deals contradicts EU law. The case stems from a dispute between French player Lasana Diara and Russian club Lokomotiv Moscow. Diara was forced to pay the club more than $11 million following a pay dispute and the player's subsequent termination. Now, the Court of Justice of the EU is saying that the FIFA system that penalized Diara and made that penalty follow him to any future club is illegal. The decision could have major implications for player transfers, which saw $6.5 billion move during the summer alone. Sports broadcaster Ben Jacobs has the latest on this, and he joins us next. I'm joined now by sports broadcaster and senior football correspondent for Give Me Sport, Ben Jacobs. Welcome, Ben. Great to be back. How are you? Great. Great to have you back on. So an EU judge has ruled that FIFA's transfer market rules, particularly related to compensation, are illegal under EU law. What exactly is being deemed illegal here? Yeah, so this is part of a long-running legal dispute between Lasana Diara 
and FIFA that went to the European Court of Justice and found in favour of the player who used to play for Chelsea and Arsenal. And Diara's legal team challenged FIFA rules on some very specific points, most notably the termination of his contract with a Russian club by the name of Lokomotiv Moscow in 2014. Then flash forwards and Diara tries to join Charleroi in 2015, but FIFA would not provide him with an ITC, which stands for International Transfer Certificate. And the reason for that is because there was a dispute with his former club, Locomotive Moscow. So Diara argued that just because there was a fine to be paid and potentially other forms of compensation due to the manner in which he left, that shouldn't have impacted on his ability to go to a new club. And at the time, Charleroi were nervous about the situation prior to it falling through because they felt like under the FIFA rules, they would also be liable to pay any compensation because the FIFA rules state that the club buying a player, in essence, if the ITC is issued, inherits the problem. So what this ruling could change is players under dispute, even though it's not the most commonplace scenario, may have the ability to effectively force their way out of a club or just leave a club if it's not prompted by them with baggage, and they will not be prevented from gaining this international transfer certificate, nor will the club going on to sign them become liable, and therefore we may see a shift where players have a little bit more power and freedom to change clubs. And so, yeah, let me just try to make sure I understand this. So basically some players, um, uh, they have a dispute with their current club and this would allow them to, to essentially leave without taking that, any of those disputes, that baggage, as he put it, with them to their new club. So, and that would Im improve their market. And uh, because it, obviously if a player is coming with a certain fine or a penalty or something with them, that's going to affect the, the price that they can get for themselves. Yeah, and also players were under the rules, and we should say are, because nothing has been changed yet, but it might be in a weaker position. Because if you run into trouble at a particular club and you have baggage preventing you from gaining what under the current rules is this international transfer certificate, then you're in a far weaker position whereby you may be forced to settle with the club that you're departing or you may not be able to move. If the rules are changed, the player will have more freedom to move within the market and any new club will not be worried about, as I said earlier, inheriting that baggage. So the point here is that if there is any scenario under the current rules where the player hasn't resolved a fine compensation, then not only do they have to in order to get the international transfer certificate to go to their next move, but if they don't and the club willingly takes the player on, then prior to formalisation, the club that are buying will also become culpable for any kind of fine or compensation. So you actually inherit a problem as a buyer and you take the baggage of the problem as a player. And should this ruling, you know, get enacted as written, where does it have the biggest effect? I mean, is it like the richest clubs, the top tier clubs, the you know, the middle ones, the you know, the maybe lower down the the pyramid? Where are we going to see the most action? Do you think it's hard to tell? Really, I, I think the biggest take from this is not a specific player or club because it, it can vary very widely. It's more a demonstration that football at large, every club at every level for every player has to abide by the same European employment laws as any other industry. And with lots of different issues, we see football do things one way and the wider industry act in another way. Look at Manchester City. Then for the Premier League to define it in another way, is football doing things one way and wider EU law being at odds with it? And effectively, that's what's being argued here as well that for Diara, he asked for FIFA to construe freedom of movement in the market like any other employment within 
the European Union, not specifically within football. And he argued there was a mismatch between football and FIFA's approach, which constrained his movement, and EU law, which protected his movement. So we're not really saying that this will have a repercussion on a big club, a small club, a rich club, a poor club, a high-profile player, a male player, a female player. It's more just that alignment to say that football can't define a rule and then vote on it internally and just because there's agreement on it or just because it's ratified or just because it's the done way, everyone consistently within Europe in this case has to go with it. Football actually has to nod to wider EU employment law and when applicable, global employment law, not the other way around. And until you bring something within sport to a European court, you don't always have these mismatches challenged, which is what DR has been able to do. And the repercussions of that are essentially going to have European employment law trump, if you like, football European employment law in the same way that Manchester City might have succeeded towards FIFA and football, not just being able to, in an insular way, self-regulate and instead having that independent European legal vantage point to align them effectively with the bigger picture. Yeah, well, fascinating stuff. Ben Jacobs, thanks for breaking it all down for us. Thanks for joining us on the show. My pleasure. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. Raiders wide receiver Devontae Adams stoked trade speculation in the best way I've ever seen. It's nearly a foregone conclusion that Adams will get traded off of the Raiders at some point this year. And last week, he seemed to indicate a destination by posting a picture of Edgar Allan Poe. It's possible that he was simply appreciating one of the masters of gothic fiction and poetry, but it's more likely that he was referencing the namesake of the Baltimore Ravens, who are named for Poe's classic poem, which incidentally I was completely obsessed with in high school. The current reporting is that he could also end up with the Jets, Saints, Steelers, or Bills. As for his time with the Raiders, it's likely that his soul from out that shadow shall be lifted nevermore. On to less poetic matters. For the first part of this year, Formula One had a growing problem. There was no drama. Red Bull dominated 2023, and it looked like they were going to do the same this year. Their top driver, Max Verstappen, won eight of the first 10 races this year, and his teammate, Sergio Perez, was often second. It was nearly impossible to imagine anyone beating them this year, and even next year seemed too soon for anyone to catch up. And then, all of a sudden, things changed. Red Bull has not won any of the last eight races, McLaren has passed them in the Constructors' Championship, and Ferrari is close behind. McLaren's Lando Norris is rapidly catching up to Verstappen in the driver's standings as well. Now there's drama, and drama is good for ticket sales. Bobby Epstein, the head of the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, says interest has picked up since Verstappen stopped winning nearly every race. The Austin race is happening on the weekend of October 20th, and that Saturday should be an intense one in Austin. There's an F1 sprint race, an M&M concert at the racetrack, and then the Longhorns are hosting Georgia that night. The race brought 420,000 people over the weekend last year, and organizers think they have a good chance of beating that number this year. Up next, Iron Man's signature event is the triathlon, which is not something your average person is even physically capable of completing. An Iron Man triathlon consists of a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike ride, and a full 26.2 mile marathon. I bet I could do that over a week, but Iron Man competitors have 17 hours to complete the entire thing. The company does host many other competitions and they are working to both build their participation ranks and spectator interest. I spoke to Iron Man CEO Scott Daru about all of that, and that conversation is coming up next. 
We're joined now by Scott DeRue, CEO of Iron Man. Welcome, Scott. Uh, thank you, Owen. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. Great to have you on. Um, so I was just looking at your your race calendar and counted. 17 events in the month of October, and that's just in the sort of, I think, the traditional Ironman swimming, biking, running. Um, and I understand you do more than just that type of race. Give us a sense of the sort of the range and the quantity of the races and the tournaments you put on. Yeah, Ironman Group today uh, is the largest organizer in the world of participation sports. Uh, so we will do about 220, 225 events. Uh, this year in 2024, uh, across 54 countries. Uh, and that spans triathlon, uh, Ironman and 70.3, but it also spans across road running, trail running, cycling, mountain biking, a whole host of endurance sports. Mm -hmm. And um, what's the process of you know, finding locations, venues for these events, especially the, the three-parters? Yeah, so location is, is one of the most important decisions that, uh, that we make uh, when we're thinking about uh, putting on these incredible experiences for our athletes. Uh, and we look at it uh, first and foremost through the athlete lens. Uh, so where do the athletes want to race? What's going to inspire them? Uh, what is the sort of majestic destination that people may want to travel to? Uh, how do we think about it being close enough that you can drive to? Uh, so we look at it through a range of criteria, all centered around uh, what is going to best serve our athletes uh, and create the, the best, most uh, inspiring uh, endurance experience, whether that's triathlon, uh, road running, trail running, or, or the others. Depending on which sport we're talking about, there are nuances, right? With triathlon, you have to have a swim course, you have to have a bike course, uh, uh, with, uh, with Ironman, you have to be able to uh, shut down and make safe over 100 miles of road for the bike course. Uh, you have to have a swim that is 2.4 miles. How do you do that in a safe but also inspiring way? With trail running, uh, you're on mountains often. You're in national parks. Uh, and so partnering with the local communities, partnering with the Forest Service, uh, uh, ski villages sometimes, all of that comes into play to create uh, these incredible experiences for athletes. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a huge logistical challenge. If you're organizing a triathlon, um, you know, let's say you've got a location picked out, how many months in advance do you have to start, you know, planning all that? Uh, you're talking years, not months. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so if you think about your Ironman triathlon, first you have to consider that most people are training for nine to 12 months of that. Right. And so they're signing up for a race, usually nine to 12 months out. Mm -hmm. Right. There are exceptions to that, but that's sort of the, the average. Uh, and so we're putting on, uh, you know, the, we're opening up registrations to 2025 events 12 months in advance. So mm -hmm. therefore, the planning for an event that's in 2025 is actually happening in 2023 or even sooner. Uh, and so you're making really long-term uh, commitments in partnership with our local communities to put on these incredible experiences. Mm -hmm. So you're working on 2026 stuff right now? Correct. Yeah, wow. Um, and really basic question, but what are your main sources of revenue? So uh, there's, there's a number of them. Uh, so first would be registrations for events. Uh, so think of it almost uh, any type of live experience, live event, where it's, whether it's tickets at a sporting event or whatever the case may be, our equivalent to that would be registration uh, for, for our events. Um, we also, in no particular order, uh, you're also looking at uh, the partners that we work with and the, the sponsorship uh, and partnership deals uh, where they want to be part of these experiences to serve and support our athletes and get closer to, to that consumer, build their brands. Uh, so we're, we're really focused on building an ecosystem of partners uh, that inspire our athletes, create products and services that uh, they find value add to their experience, whether it be in running or trail running or triathlon or whatever that may be. Uh, and so that's a big part of, of the business per se. 
Um, from a merchandising and, and product licensing perspective, that's a big part uh, of the business. Uh, so those are several uh, you know, streams of revenue, if you will. There are others, uh, but that gives you a, a flavor. Sure, yeah. And I mean, the, the events you put on, many of them have, for all many of the logistical reasons you're talking about and just putting on the event, also very hard to make it into a spectator sport because you've got hundreds of miles of bike track um, and just the, the length of the events themselves time-wise. Um, are, are those things you're trying to overcome and make it you know more of a, a spectator activity or you know, are you just kind of sticking with your bread and butter for now? No, so we, we have many fans around the world that are watching our, uh, our events uh, through live broadcast. And maybe they're friends and family of the athletes that are participating. But in many cases, they're just fans of the sport. They participate themselves. And so the thing they enjoy doing on a Saturday or Sunday uh, is sitting down and watching a triathlon or a trail run. Uh, and through advances in technology, uh, through our partners, we're able to now bring really world-class live broadcast uh, to millions of people around the world. So pretty much any country that you're sitting in uh, on, a, on a Saturday or Sunday, you can, at, you can watch live uh, our events. Uh, and that's really, really exciting. And, and in the big picture, big scheme of things, is a relatively new advancement uh, in endurance sports. And that's true. You know, this weekend, uh, I, I was unable to attend one of our uh, triathlon events, but I was able to watch it uh, live on the broadcast. We had our UTMB trail running uh, World Series final uh, a few weeks ago, and, and uh, I had the privilege of being there. But in trail running, you can't experience it the same way that you can in a triathlon because they're in the mountains. They're running overnight. Uh, and so we're able to actually able to watch uh, through very uh, strategic placement of cameras on the course uh, using drone technology, mobile satellites, et cetera you're able to watch these, uh, these endurance events live uh, and see a lot of the action take place. It's actually really exciting to watch. Yeah, I mean, just the, in the, the camera work itself kind of almost feels like part of the action in that if, if you have to be tracking these guys by drone or something. On a, a heavier topic, so this is not you guys, but an athlete drowned at a CrossFit event in August. Um, and, you know, and again, that's, that's CrossFit, it's not Ironman. But, you know, your athletes, they push themselves to their limits and maybe beyond their limits, uh, sometimes in, in three different events in one day. And each of those types of events um, carries risks. Uh, how do you work to ensure that your athletes are safe? So there, there are a few answers to that question. But before I answer it, uh, certainly thoughts go out to the family and friends of that athlete uh, that... Uh, uh, that you noted, uh, who was competing in the, in the CrossFit games, uh, and, uh, and passed away. Certainly anytime that happens, uh, the endurance community, it's heartbreaking. And so just wanted to, to acknowledge, uh, the, the family and friends of that particular athlete and say that our thoughts are, are with them. Um, it, the, the safety of our athletes is priority one, two, and three. Uh, and it actually begins before the athletes ever get to the race. And this is true whether we're talking triathlon or road running, trail running, et cetera. But we want to make sure that our athletes have the knowledge and the training that is going to set them up for success, not only to finish the race, not only to perform well, but to also be safe. And then from there, we employ world-class safety professionals and safety teams uh, and the best practices in the business. And that's true both within the Ironman group team, but also our partners on the ground, local police, fire, EMS, uh, making sure that we have all the right safety standards in place, both within our team, as well as our local community partners to make sure that if something does happen, that we can mobilize quickly to make sure that we take care of those athletes. Uh, and whether it's uh, in uh, a swimming context, like in triathlon, uh, certainly we have um, the, uh, the best in class safety standards and resources that we deploy to every swim course uh, in our portfolio globally. And, uh, and that is true across every race uh, within the Ironman portfolio. 
Uh, but the same thing is true on our bike courses, right? So, uh, you know, some courses are flat, some courses are hilly, some courses are faster than others. Sometimes, you know, accidents happen on, on bike courses. Making sure that we have the right safety standards in place, the right resources in place to take care of our athletes is, is priority number one, two, and three. Uh, and our teams do a really good job of working with our athletes before they get to the start line, but certainly during the event to make sure that everybody is safe. Uh, and even if they don't finish, uh, they have, they have a good day. I'll leave it there. Scott Drew. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks Owen. Take care. Time now for front office sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Savannah Bananas are too big for baseball. The team pioneered Banana Ball, which is like baseball with more chaos and more TikTok dances. The Bananas went on a tour of MLB stadiums this year and sold them out everywhere they went. Their conclusion, they need to mix in some bigger venues. The team's 2025 schedule involves 18 MLB stadiums and three football stadiums, each with a capacity around 70,000 or more. They will play in the homes of Clemson, the Tennessee Titans, and Carolina Panthers and most MLB teams. Bananas owner Jesse Cole told ESPN that they played in front of 1 million fans this year and will play in front of 2 million next year. Being one of those 2 million fans might not be as easy as it sounds. Cole says their waitlist is 3 million people long. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell some friends or just give us a shout out on social media. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.